Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Norman Swan. A new strain of COVID-19 has been confirmed in locations around the world. The new variant combines aspects of both Delta and Omicron. And it comes as the nation's top vaccine advisory group has recommended a winter booster jab for the most vulnerable Australians, people aged over 65, those who are immunocompromised and Indigenous Australians over 50. It's for a window for four to six months after you have had uh, your first booster. And uh, that's based on medical advice. Our daily life is very different these days. For almost two years, we were hooked on the routine of political leaders delivering media conferences detailing cases, hospitalizations and deaths from the virus. Life may have almost returned to normal and we're not talking numbers so obsessively, but it hasn't stopped the deaths. Casey Briggs joins us. Casey, what can you tell us? Hi, Norman. Well, there's more and more cases every day at the moment. Australia has this week crossed back uh, over seeing more than 60,000 uh, infections reported on a daily basis. So they're the sorts of numbers we haven't seen since the week before Australia Day in January in this big Omicron wave. Hospitalisations too are climbing. They're back above 2,000 people admitted into hospitals with COVID-19 um, at the moment. And the, the, the broad expectation is that these numbers will not climb. Uh, the share of, uh, of all cases that end up in hospital, I should say, will not get as high as it did back in that wave. Uh, here's South Australia, for example, which is, uh, you know, comparatively speaking, had a relatively small Omicron wave part one, at least. In fact, per capita, this, this wave here is less than half the size of what uh, was experienced in Victoria and New South Wales. But cases are really quite rapidly shooting upward again uh, to about the size of that first wave, Omicron part two is. And SA Health thinks that those numbers are going to go even higher to something in the order of about 8,000 cases a day in South Australia. They also think hospitalisations are going to continue to climb from here, but they're not thinking, despite the fact that cases will go so high, they're not thinking uh, that hospitalisations will exceed or go far beyond uh, the peak that we saw back in January. But cases, uh, cases and hospitalisations are going up, and so that will may well mean that deaths do go up as well. They've been sitting in Australia nationally at about 20 per day for the best part of two weeks now. Fingers crossed, due to you know uh, the increased uptake of boosters, all the people that have now had uh, uh, the, the infection as well, we won't see the sort of levels of deaths that we did see just a few months ago, but they may well increase from here. And Norman, I might start sounding like a broken record, but those death numbers, they probably would be a little bit lower had these numbers been a bit higher. Booster numbers in particular, just under half of the Australian population has had their third shot. But there are more than a quarter of the total population uh, who are eligible for that third shot and yet to get it. Um, among the states, Western Australia is actually doing pretty well in terms of booster take up. In fact, about 80% of all people eligible for a third dose have now had it. And I've got to say, New South Wales, after doing so well getting second doses into arms so quickly during the Delta outbreak this year, has really started to lag behind in third doses. Norman, I don't, you know, it's hard to measure uh, exactly the reasons why for this, uh, but, you know, it may well be the case. I suspect one of the reasons could be that people who have been recently infected have had COVID-19 this year may well feel like they no longer need to get a third dose, at least not for now. But as we've seen, just because we're not in lockdowns anymore, just because we're not seeing the sorts of public health restrictions we lived through for the last couple of years, does not mean the pandemic's over. No, it certainly doesn't. Thanks very much, Casey. So what lies ahead in this pandemic? Dr Deborah Cromer is an infectious disease modeler at the University of New South Wales and the Kirby Institute. Deborah, welcome to the virus. When do you expect BA2 to peak? Look, that's hard to tell, but um, from what we've seen in other countries, um, these things probably peak after around about six weeks or so. So we're probably looking um, towards the end of April, uh, mid, mid to the end of April to have a peak and then a slow decrease after that. But that obviously depends quite a bit on, you know, if there's any other variants that come in and, and any particular changes that we see. So we're looking sometime in April, I would say. Could you see BA2 coming back to bite us in winter? Oh, look, I think it's possible. I think that there's a good chance that another variant will come out um, between then. What we've seen is that this pandemic has only been around for um, for two years and we've already had the ancestral strain. We've had well, uh, we've had alpha, beta, delta, omicron, now BA2. So I think... Um, 
probably more likely that we'll just get another variant that we haven't predicted yet. So Chinese scientists have recently written about Deltacron, this combination of the Delta and Omicron virus genetics, if you like. And they also talk, it's a really good paper, they talk about the recombination of genes that could occur if it goes into animals and comes back out, which, uh, om- which the virus already has and the dangers of that. How, to what extent is this sort of combined version of the virus, particularly if it goes into animals, a real danger to us moving forward? Look, I think what the main uh, danger is when a variant emerges, whether from recombination or just because um, things about the virus change, um, the DNA sequence changes, uh, and and the more different that the new variant or recombined variant looks from the original strain or from the strain against which ha- we have immunity, um, the worse off we might be. So the Delta virus uh, variant was reasonably different from the original strain, but it wasn't different enough that the the viruses that we, the vaccines that we had, they still worked very well. Um, The Omicron variant was more different from the original strain. So we really needed booster doses there to deal with it, to boost people's immunity up. And if we end up with a variant that's even more different from the immunity that people already have, whether due to Delta or Omicron or vaccination, then that's when we're going to see a reduced um, immunity in people and when we're going to start worrying about increasing case numbers and increasing severe cases. So what we really need to look at is how different is the new variant from what we have immunity to already. So we shouldn't put away the masks just yet or indeed potential so. measures in high-risk indoor environments? Yeah, no, I think we we still need to be vigilant. One thing that um, um, COVID-19 has taught us is that it's able to change about as fast as we're able um, to modify our control measures. So I think we really do need to stay on top of things. We need to encourage people to get boosted vaccinations. We we need to keep our um, appropriate measures in place. Um, And we just need to really stay on our toes in terms of being willing to adjust our behaviour and our and our strategy in order to combat the virus. Deborah Cromer, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, could you have had COVID but just not know it? ABC's medical reporter Sophie Scott joins us. I'll have the answer to that and more as I examine some of the issues you've been the most curious about. This week, the New South Wales coroner confirmed that COVID-19 was responsible for the death of a two-month-old baby back in December. This news comes after the death of a previously healthy two-year-old in the last week. It's understood the baby is Australia's youngest COVID victim. And while death and serious illness are rare among children, parents want to know what they should do if their child does get the virus. Dr Margie Denshin is a paediatrician specialising in immunisation at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Welcome to the virus, Margie. Have we underestimated the impact of uh, the virus on children? We know that the uh, vast majority of children, in fact, do experience either very mild symptoms or even asymptomatic infection. But as you've just outlined, severe disease does still happen in children and they may need admission to hospital. And some can become severely unwell, especially if they have certain underlying medical conditions. So I think we do need to be aware that COVID can be severe in children, and we need to focus on getting eligible children vaccinated. Now, we've under we're not vaccinating at that high enough rate yet, are we, in the five to 11 year olds? Vaccination coverage in the primary school age children for one dose is around 56, 57% nationally and about 12% for two doses. So we've got a long way to go in terms of the coverage that we've achieved in the adult um, population for 16 year old uh, individuals and over, it's now 95% for two doses. But having said that, internationally, we're doing very well. We're on par with Canada and countries like the US and the UK are far behind our coverage here in Australia. But that's cold comfort if kids are going to get infected. Um, And just before we get on to even younger children, what we said before on the virus is that the safety profile is excellent. The safety profile is excellent. Uh, In primary school age children, the common and expected side effects occur less frequently than teenagers and young adults. 
And we have not seen uh, a vaccine safety signal for myocarditis or inflammation of the heart, which we were concerned about having seen that after the second dose uh, in teenagers, particularly young men. We have not seen that in primary school age children. And in fact, the risk of myocarditis is one tenth that of the teenage age group. So that's really good news for parents. It's going to be a while before we have vaccines available for the under fives. When we've got such a surge on and so many thousands of cases in Australia, what can parents do to protect their younger children, if anything? Yeah, that's right. The primary school age group under fives uh, don't yet have a vaccine available, although we do hope that will happen um, in the next three to six months. And we've seen an announcement this week um, from Moderna seeking uh, approval in the FDA for the uh, under sixes. So hopefully a vaccine is on the horizon. But in terms of parents caring for younger children, the most important thing is to make sure that children are drinking enough, that we keep up their fluids, that we use Panadol or Nurofen to treat any fever and that they get lots of rest and sleep. And importantly, that we really need to look out for any more serious signs of infection, which is usually listlessness, difficulty breathing, um, very high fever. Those children need to see a doctor and potentially come into hospital for further treatment. Margie Dungeon, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now stay with us because we'll soon be joined by one of the scientists behind an Australian study looking at the impacts of coronavirus. What do we know about long COVID? Professor Greg Dore joins us shortly. We've been focusing though on the situation here in Australia, but what does the spread look like overseas? Casey is with us again. Hi Casey. Hi Norman. Well here is the global case curve of COVID-19 and you know these uh, waves that we saw so much of in 2020 and 2021 they don't look like much when you compare it to the first global Omicron wave. We've seen cases peaking at about on average three and a half million a day around the world. They've come down to now about half that 1.7 million or so a day but it's obviously still a lot. In terms of deaths, well deaths peaked globally just before vaccines came on the scene and since then we've seen this very slow downward trajectory even though we've seen very big waves of the virus. Uh, deaths are continuing to slowly come downward although I do, I do say very slow. Uh, we're looking still at about 5,000 global deaths being reported. Um, every single day. And we know, we've known for years, these numbers are a pretty imperfect measure of virus prevalence around the world. It's hard to know uh, how you can compare two different countries that are measuring these things in slightly different ways. For example, Australia's case curve at the moment is actually uh, very high, uh, at about 2,000 cases per 100,000 uh, population higher than in Europe, higher than in South America, higher than in North America. But when you look at deaths, in fact, Australia has a much lower case fatality rate than many of these other reasons. And a couple of reasons for that, I think one, I think Australia is probably still catching more cases through testing than much of the rest of the world. We are doing more tests on average uh, than the rest of the world. And second, Australia does still have a very high vaccination uh, rate, you know, looking at in the top kind of 20 countries in the world, including some very small island nations in those top 20 as well. But as we've seen, Australia is starting to fall behind on third doses. And now there are countries like Australia where we're looking even at fourth uh, doses. And that brings us to Israel, a country that's a few months ahead of us in terms of administering fourth doses. And they did a big batch of them at the start of the year. Focus like Australia is going to on older people, people over 60 and of the 70 plus population in Israel, about half are now quadruple dosed. Israel has just come through quite a nasty Omicron wave, their biggest wave to yet, even if you include, exclude those two big outlier days, biggest wave of cases they've seen to death and a big uh, record number of deaths as well in just the last few uh, months. The question for the boffins, Norman, is are those extra fourth doses making a significant difference? Well, let's go to Israel now to find out more about the fourth dose because they've probably got more experience of giving fourth doses than anyone else in the world. And here to tell us about it is Professor Cyril Cohn, who's Professor of Immunology at bar -Ilan University in Tel Aviv. How closely has it been studied in terms of safety and effectiveness? So basically, you know, in parallel, we ran a, a clinical trial. Usually you run a clinical trial, a small clinical trial, at least, you know, before you do that. But on the other hand, we knew more or less 
uh, from our past experience, you know, especially with a third dose, that uh, most of the side effects we saw with a third dose were uh, similar or sometimes even less than what we saw with a second dose. So uh, there was a real question, I would say almost a bet to decide without much data what to do. But with the rise of the Omicron, uh, um, it was decided that it would be uh, preferable to open that possibility to the public, at least to the people that may benefit from a fourth dose. And basically, uh, that's what happened. So we have now f the first results of that, uh, that are actually showing uh, a mixed, I would say, pattern in terms of protection, side effects, and uh, benefit, I, mean, I would say benefit so, to certain populations. So let's go through it one by one. First of all, the yes. vaccine effectiveness in terms of preventing infection uh, with Omicron. What have you found with the fourth dose? Yeah, I would say that it is very low. I mean, we know that Omicron is extremely contagious. And on the other hand, it's also very different from the original strain on which the vaccine is based, meaning that it can escape viral uh, vaccine protection to some extent in terms of transmission and in terms of infection. Our latest, uh, latest figures actually put that effectiveness for, uh, uh, I would say, a false dose around 30% in terms of infection, which is not a lot. And that also seems to decrease with time after the false dose. And what about protection against severe disease, which is the key thing? Exactly. So these are the good news to some extent for those populations that are extremely at risk, meaning, again, over the age of 60 and uh, uh, with uh, comorbidities, etc., and underlying uh, diseases, uh, we have observed, uh, I would say, a factor of three to four more protection uh, f uh, compared to people that got only three doses after four months, meaning that it can, in terms of severe disease, it can protect you better three to four times. So that, uh, I think there's been a study that suggests it brings you back to the level you had at the third dose. Is that right? It brings you back in terms of antibodies, yes, uh, to the level of the false dose, perhaps a little bit better, but not a lot. And in terms of severe disease, yes, more or less, perhaps a little bit more. Well, that's good news. And this is with Pfizer and Moderna. Yes, this is, a, I mean, I would say essentially with Pfizer, we have also a trial with Moderna in which the effectiveness of the false dose in terms of infection was even lower. It was, uh, but again, these were small numbers, so it's very difficult to to tell. In terms of protection, again, we are mainly uh, basing our assumptions on Pfizer because this is the most extensively used vaccine in Israel. And what about safety and side effects? So basically, as before and as we accepted, uh, I think that uh, most of the side effects were similar to what we saw in the past, meaning, you know, sore muscles, uh, fever, uh, in the same, more or less the same proportion. Uh, we haven't noted, you know, any particular side effect. And what about, heart, what about heart inflammation? So heart inflammation actually was discovered in Israel, what we, what we call myocarditis. And actually, you know, it was only or it was detected mainly for people between the age uh, of 16 to 25. And uh, actually, we did not discover, uh, or at least we did not note a high frequency of myocarditis above normal in older people. So since most of the people that were vaccinated with that false dose were actually uh, uh, people over the age of 60, so there's no, I would say, report right now of a significant increase in myocarditis. So you would argue then what? That it is worth giving to people over 60? I think that... Uh, Take on message would be that uh, it is uh, actually more, I would say, beneficial to people that you know might end up in a severe condition. Meaning, again, people that would be over the age of 60 or even 70, people with vulnerabilities, people that are immunocompromised, etc., for the rest of the population. And as you see, Israel has decided not to go into a wide campaign, okay, uh, for uh, the false dose, because we do believe that on the one hand, the difference between three and four doses for healthy people, for young people, uh, does not justify a, a, a campaign. And second, the Omicron, and its successor that we have now in Israel, the BA2 variant, 
do not seem to cause a lot of severe disease compared to what we knew in the past, especially in young people. And is Israel thinking about a fifth dose yet? And uh, not exactly, no, no, right now, no. What we are evaluating actually in Israel, and that has been published, we are evaluating an uh, Omicron uh, custom made vaccine, okay, and uh, a vaccine from Pfizer that is adapted to the new variant to the Omicron. So this is right now in trial, not only in Israel, but around a few places. And once we have those results, we'll be able to decide uh, what kind of vaccine or will an Omicron based vaccine will be better than the one we have right now. But I have to tell you that for most of the Israelis, the fourth dose was actually the virus. In other words, natural infection gives you that level of immunity less against the next Omicron. Look, Cyril, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Stay healthy. One of the greatest unknowns is the long-term effects of COVID-19. Professor Greg Dorr, who's Professor of Epidemiology at the Kirby Institute in Sydney, is part of a study looking into long COVID. Welcome to the virus, Greg. Uh, a pleasure, Norman. Um, you've recently published on this. Before we get to the symptoms, what's happening in the immune system of people who are uh, getting long-term symptoms? Well, it's really interesting. We followed uh, a large number of people through the St. Vincent's uh, Sydney cohort. Um, and it's not only the people that develop long COVID symptoms, but people generally following a COVID infection have an active immune system. So there's what you might call an immunological fingerprint we see right through to eight months following initial infection. Does that mean it could be treated? In other words, if you, could you suppress that immune response and then prevent problems? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think some of the aspects of the immune activation, if you want to call it like that, there's a particular type of uh, immune activation. Some of the type 1 interferons are elevated. And it does open the door to potential therapeutic strategies. So there may be some immune modulators that we could look at to address long COVID. It's always got to be balanced with you know, the downside of using sort of uh, therapies that affect the immune system. Now, you've been following a group of people um, at the University of New South Wales and St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. What are the hallmark symptoms that are developing that are clustering around long COVID? Well, there seem to be two different types of uh, syndromes, if you want to call it that. There's a sort of a neurological cluster. So people will have ongoing fatigue and quite you know, severe fatigue. And that could be associated with what many describe as a, a brain fog. So issues with attention, concentration, short term memory. Then there's more of sort of cardiorespiratory cluster. They can still have the fatigue, but often they describe chest discomfort, um, palpitations and ongoing issues in terms of breathlessness. Now, there have been a couple of papers recently, one showing long-term brain effects. There's been a Chinese study from the Wuhan cohort two years ago suggesting that there's loss of cognitive function. And then with the heart, you were talking about a moment ago, you know, for 12 months, increased risks of heart attack and stroke. Is that panning out in the Australian data? Um, I think the neurological stuff is really interesting. We've been doing detailed evaluation of neurocognitive function. Um, and there's definitely a small minority, uh, about 10% of people that have significant neurocognitive impairment, and that seems to be sustained for several months. Um, we're following now people into the second year, and hopefully we'll see that neurological uh, impairment decline into the second year. In, in a sense, it's not surprising. Uh, following SARS, and um, there were long COVID, include, including long-term neurological effects that were out to sort of two years. So we've seen this before with coronavirus. And just briefly, what proportion of people um, are getting long COVID from your study? Somewhere between 20 and 30% of people, if it's defined by having symptoms out to three months following initial infection, would be described as having long COVID. Sometimes those symptoms are relatively mild and obviously a, there's an enormous spectrum in terms of disability and symptoms. Greg, thank you for joining us. A pleasure, Norm. We may be two years into the pandemic, but that hasn't stopped your questions coming in. The ABC's medical reporter, Sophie Scott, is here with some of the answers. Is Delta still around? Look, we're hearing a lot about Omicron these days, but some people are still being infected with the Delta strain. Research from the Australasian College of Emergency Medicine released earlier this year suggested about one in four patients ending up in hospital had the Delta variant. Authorities say Omicron is the dominant strain in Australia. 
And it's a little tricky to know how much of the Delta strain is around, as many people are now doing the rapid antigen tests, which can't tell you which variant you have. And many states and territories don't sequence the virus in all positive PCR tests, as there are now so many cases. Either way, your best protection against any strain of COVID is to make sure you have all the recommended doses of the vaccine, including the booster shot. Could I have had COVID and just not know it? And does that even matter? It is possible that you might have had COVID-19 and recovered and not realised it. But there are some telltale signs to look for. If you had a really bad cold, there is a chance it could have been COVID if you didn't get tested. But one difference is that COVID can last for two weeks or longer, while a cold might only last for a few days. COVID is also more likely to cause a fever and make it harder for you to breathe. You might also have had shortness of breath and a loss of taste or smell, which many COVID patients have. A persistent cough and extreme fatigue lasting two weeks or more might signal it was COVID. The only way to know for sure that you've had COVID-19 is to have your blood tested to see if you have the antibodies that fight the virus. Antibodies are the proteins that your body makes to fight off infections. And if you have the antibodies, you are less likely to get COVID again, although some people have reported getting it twice. Are vaccines being updated? Vaccines might need to be updated if the virus has changed enough so that the antibodies created by the original vaccine don't recognise and fend off the new variant. In other words, if there are too many changes to the virus, the existing vaccines won't work as well. Existing mRNA vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer use the spike protein from the original strain of coronavirus. Scientists could swap the genetic code of the original spike protein for the one from the new variants. So a new vaccine would induce antibodies which bind to the virus and prevent it from infecting cells. Professor Deborah Fuller from the University of Washington says the process of updating vaccines like these is relatively easy. She says it could be done in just about 50 days. So that's really good news. Is it just me? I feel like people are sick with a bug that resembles COVID in symptoms, but repeatedly test negative for COVID. Could there be some secondary virus doing the rounds? There are other viruses circulating now that Australia's opened up and we're mingling a lot more without masks. If you or someone you know is feeling sick and it isn't COVID, it could be the flu. When we're in lockdowns and we were wearing masks, we saw very few cases of the flu. But health authorities say we could be gearing up for a big flu season because there isn't much natural immunity in the community and they're urging people to make sure you get a flu shot this year. In particular, it's children aged six months or up to the age of five, adults 65 years and over, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged six months and over, women in any stage of pregnancy, and people aged six months and over with any medical conditions which increase your risk of complications, you should really be getting a flu shot. And that's the show for this week. Thanks for your company. Bye for now.